women who have influence and who have brains and make things happen and change things around them, that doesn't fit with the picture that the woman should be subservient. So if you make her therefore evil, then men can say, look what happens when you put a woman in charge. These women were extraordinary figures of their time. Important discussions about issues like women's power, women's sexuality. All these stories about women in the Bible have sex in common. They have to be recast as evil. They are women who change the world around them. She's undoubtedly the most famous woman in the Bible. Even the irreligious think they know all about Eve. But much of what we've heard is really just malicious gossip. I think most people uh, do not know the real Eve, the Eve as presented uh, in the Genesis account, because culturally we have a lot of baggage that we have placed on Eve. Certainly the history of uh, the interpretation of the story, Eve has taken much of the fall. And in the history of art, you often uh, see, see Eve uh, portrayed in a very seductive manner. Even the serpent often has a female head. There's this perception of women as evil and seductress. She's the seductress uh, who tempts Adam with her sexuality in order to make him fall. So sex is right there often in the interpretation of the stories, right at the beginning, even though they're not ashamed of their nakedness at this point and presumably are innocent about sex, but the stories have been interpreted still so that she seduces him, which of course is about sex. But there's no word temptation in the Bible. There's no seduction. There's none of those aspects that tend to cast Eve in a negative light. Eve is not cursed. There's no Satan. There is no sin in the story. The word sin doesn't appear there. It's only in the later interpretations that that becomes associated with Eve. What really happened in the Bible bears little resemblance to the story with which we're most familiar. Adam, the first man, is lonely in the Garden of Eden. God decides to create a companion, a woman from Adam's rib or so the story goes. But Eve is not content in paradise. When the serpent suggests she try the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Eve goes for it <laughs> and tempts Adam to take a bite too. They are expelled from the Garden of Eden and the human journey has been a struggle ever since. Eve tends to get a bad rap in early Christian literature, in Jewish, early Jewish literature, and throughout popular culture to this very day. She becomes a symbol of the seductress, the temptress, as the one who is responsible for humankind's fall into sin, for the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. That's a very heavy burden to bear. Some scholars have placed Adam and Eve's home, the Garden of Eden, in what's now southern Iraq at the confluence of four rivers. Three major religions come together here too. Genesis 1 to 3 is a tale of origins. Uh, and it's not just a tale of origins, it's a sacred tale uh, for people within the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition, and the Muslim tradition. Over centuries, different interpreters added their two cents, undoubtedly affected by the times in which they lived the story gets reinterpreted. And then that interpretation gets elaborated and emphasized and, and grows over time so that you get the devil, woman as the devil's gateway, for instance, in Tertullian. And the rest is history, as they say. That theme continues with some permutations and variations and so on. But it's, it becomes very prominent in Augustine, one of the most important um, church fathers. These earlier interpreters, Paul, Tertullian, Augustine, they set the stage for understanding Eve as a, a sort of inferior figure to, to Adam, and therefore women as inferior to men. 
In the 17th century, Eve's reputation as a notorious fallen woman was sealed in the epic poem Paradise Lost by John Milton. He had a very hierarchical view of the universe, God, um, humanity, animals, and within humanity, the hierarchy meant man, woman, under man. So he has taken that domination theme literally and played it out in his depiction of the first couple. Milton is fairly kind to her. He doesn't make her um, an evil character, but he makes her unwise, very easily deceived by argument. Where Adam is heroic in that version. Adam gives himself up and eats the fruit because he loves Eve so much he must have her. And why is this old story of what happened at the dawn of creation still important? Because for centuries, it has had a profound effect on intimate human relations. So often when people try to imagine, you know, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? They return to Genesis 1 to 3 and interpretations of the text therefore have enormous social payoff uh, in our own time because however we construe these original human beings, uh, we will see them as the model for contemporary human beings. In today's popular culture, Adam and Eve have also become strikingly secular symbols. Search the internet for references to the first couple, and you'll quickly come upon dating sites that focus on finding your soulmate. That is, if you don't first stumble across sites selling sex toys. If you Google Adam and Eve, the first hit that you will get is Adam and Eve sex toys. If you were to Google Christian online dating sites or Adam and Eve online dating sites, you'll find all kinds of hits. Uh, some of them really focus on Adam and Eve as soulmates. But what did Eve actually do to earn such a naughty reputation? In popular mythology, from the moment of creation, it's been downhill for woman's reputation. The idea that woman is the root of all evil is not something actually found in the Genesis story, but baggage that has been given to her um, from interpreters who have had issues with women and have projected that onto the account. Initially, God gave man and woman both the same jobs, to look after every living creature and to be fruitful and multiply themselves. Genesis provides us with two creation stories. In the first one, male and female are created simultaneously. There is no hierarchical relationship between them. They are both addressed by God. There is a first human, often identified as Adam, but in fact, the word that's used to, to translate man at the beginning of the story is a generic term. It's a generic term for a human being. One can make a very strong case for the fact that the first human created by God is gender inclusive or non-gendered, either way you want to look at it. And then there's this cosmic surgery because God says that there's something wrong if there's only one of these things, there need to be a pair because God understands that procreation comes through copulation, so <laughs> you need a matched pair. It's in the second story that woman is created from man's rib and things get ticklish. <laughs> if you just read that story on the surface level, it really does seem that woman is created uh, to meet the male need for companionship. And she is then created out of a part of his body. And from that has been derived a social structure in which male are seen as dominant and women as subordinate. It's at that point that we really start to see the kind of gender politics of the biblical text coming through. So Eve there will now be responsible for things that um, I suppose the, the first writer in the first story really wasn't interested in. That story is about order and creation and beauty and perfection. The second story is about um, humanity in, in all of its uh, muddy uh, intricacies, you know, all of the things that can go right and all of the things that can go wrong. 
um, the text actually says that the woman is made uh, as a helper to the man. Uh, but calling the woman a helper doesn't necessarily indicate that she has a subordinate role. By the time Milton wrote Paradise Lost in the 17th century, the word rib remained as the part of Adam from which his mate was created. The ancient meaning of rib had been lost. Another misconception is that this is a, there's a rib involved, that a rib is taken out of the side of the first human being. But in fact, that word probably should be translated side. Of course, that would make Eve separate but equal. Definitely not the popular interpretation in Milton's 17th century and beyond. Not one to let the facts get in the way of a good story. Milton embellished the story with detail that simply isn't there in the Bible. Like that Eve convinces a reluctant Adam to work in separate areas of the garden, leaving her alone when the snake approaches. Most readers approaching the story don't realize that Adam is standing next to Eve during the whole episode with the snake or serpent. Biblical narrative, just the literary style of, of Hebrew narrative, always only has two people talking at once. So it's been misinterpreted as somehow Adam gets bewitched or beguiled or seduced by Eve um, and isn't a full aware partner um, knowing what's going on. Um, but he is. He's standing next to Eve the whole time. We all know what happened after Eve met the snake. Or do we? When Eve tempted Adam with that apple from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she got them booted out of paradise forever. <laughs> and ever since, women have been trying to shake the image of the seductive bad girl who needs the strong hand of a good man to set her straight. But none of that's in the Bible. The Bible doesn't even name the famous fruit. Eve might have handed Adam a pear for all we know. Uh, so the question is, why? how does the apple get in, into the picture in the first place? It comes from the Latin translation of, uh, of the um, Hebrew scriptures. And then the play on words with the Latin word malum, which means apple, but it also means evil. And so oh, that's how you kind of get that cluster of images uh, around the apple. So that's one of the ways in which we know that that ideas that developed about the story long after the story took its final shape have been kind of superimposed on the story so that without going back to look at what's actually there, people think they know what's there. The snake did choose Eve to approach with the offer of fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The snake approaches her, not the man, presumably like most women, she's more vocal, more articulate, and uh, it makes more sense to have the, for those kinds of reasons, not because she's gullible or stupid or um, prone to evil, but simply because she's a better dialogue partner. And of course, she ends up uh, saying, yeah, that's a good idea, I better have some of that. And she takes the fruit and gives some to the man, and he eats too. One of the things that's really interesting about that, uh, that scene is that she's really the active, dynamic character. The serpent plays on Eve's curiosity. What the biblical story shows is um, Eve as someone searching for knowledge and wisdom. And that's the temptation that the serpent places before her, to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge that is enticing her and that the serpent assures her will, will come to her she eats of this, of this fruit. That's what attracts her. And then, so generations have been taught, Eve tempts Adam with the fruit. Oh, does Eve trick Adam? No, I would, no, Eve does not trick Adam. Eve simply says, here's some fruit, and he eats it. So there is no trickery. And the fact that he has no protest um, doesn't say, wait a minute, hold on. 
um, is seen as something that is very telling and perhaps the reason why when God comes looking for them in the garden, he calls out to Adam first. In antiquity, uh, writers tried to fill in that gap by suggesting things. They suggested that she nagged him, that she said she wouldn't sleep with him again, uh, all sorts of things that she cried tears are woman's arsenal, that she cried and finally he was persuaded to eat. Actually the text never says anything like that. There's just a really big gap. She hands it to him, he eats. So they ate and now had knowledge of good and evil that previously belonged only to God. When God challenges them, it's nobody's finest hour. God seemed to be angry at uh, the disobedience of the couple. Adam, first of all. It's Adam whom God first addresses, um, and then Adam passes it off to Eve, of course. I think the biblical story does not portray her as an evil person. It assigns some measure of responsibility to the serpent and shows Adam as a gullible, passive individual. She says, eat, and he eats. And then he tries to blame her, and she blames a snake, and, uh, and they all get kicked out and um, given certain uh, punishments. Now the first humans will be expelled from paradise. To stop them from also eating of the tree of life and gaining immortality, too. Well, isn't that kind of mean? And I'll say, well, look when the expulsion comes. It's after all of the punishments. Would you really like to live forever, given all of the things that you're just told is going to happen to you? Even if it wasn't Eve's fault that the world's first couple got kicked out of paradise, life on the outside is tough. And maybe that's the point of the story. Life is tough. And so it tells us why do people work? Why do people have uh, pain in childbirth? You know, it gives reasons for that. And those reasons are that, that the humans didn't obey God. This story is a way of helping Israelites cope with the reality of their lives. The reality of their lives is how to survive in a rather uncongenial environment. They were agriculturalists, but soils were poor. Rainfall was very erratic. There were three out of 20 years, there were droughts. Famine was recurrent. Um, hunger was common. Work was very hard. How were they to understand that kind of reality? And so a story emerges, as it does for peoples across cultures. Why are things the way they are? According to some Bible scholars, the idea of man's mastery over woman has been wrongly generalized from a very specific need of ancient times for more children. The infant mortality rate was such that most women would have had to bear twice as many children as they wanted to have living children. So the sexuality in here is the man's call. The wife doesn't get to say, I'm sorry, dear, I'm too tired tonight basically, is what that's all about. The dominion is not a general social dominion. It's in keeping with the theme of that one verse, that a woman has to have multiple pregnancies. She will be turning towards her husband, and he has to have the right to have sex with her um, whenever uh, it, it's the time. And this is not about general dominion. Some feminist scholars have gone further claiming Eve as the mother of science. Well, this is what some women uh, feminist uh, scholars have argued. Since we are going to be accused of eating of the tree and the emphasis is going to be on us, which is not biblical, but since it's going to take place, then we're going to uh, appropriate that term and say, okay, if we're the ones who ate of the fruit of the tree, then aren't we the source of all knowledge? Aren't we the source of reason? Aren't we the first scientists? The lesson for modern man, Christian or not, may be in contemplating the consequences of our choices when we put our own desires and ambition above living in harmony with the natural world. In Genesis 1 and 2, even though we have two distinct creation stories, they do have some similarity. 
And that similarity, I think, is founded on the idea that this is the way things were. There was once an, a time when there was no predator or prey. Uh, humans uh, basically lived in harmony with their environment, but also in harmony with each other. And then with Genesis 3, what happens is everything falls apart. All of the harmonious relationships that you have in Genesis 1 and 2 are now fractured, including the relationship between humankind and God. Far from being the temptress who caused the fall of man, Eve can now be seen as simply one half of the couple who initiated the human journey. This is a painful thing that all of us as humans have to confront. We have to confront that we have been introduced to experience, just as in the Garden of uh, Eden, Eve and Adam were introduced to experience. And that's something that we have to cope with. It does color our world, it alters the landscape, but it is something that we can live through. And John Milton at the end of Paradise Law says, he gives us this wonderful image of Adam and Eve walking hand in hand out of the garden into a world of experience. And it's a very egalitarian image to see them walking hand in hand. And that's what I think we need to do in the modern world. Men and women have to walk hand in hand in this world of experience. If we want to be more spiritual, more intellectual, uh, more um, virtuous bodily beings, this is what we have to go hand in hand. These women were extraordinary figures of their time. Important discussions about issues like women's power, women's sexuality. All these stories about women in the Bible have sex in common. They have to be recast as evil. They are women who change the world around them. When she cut Samson's hair, the Hebrew strongman lost his power, and Delilah became a synonym for temptress. But was Delilah a bad girl or just badly misunderstood? Even people who go to church or synagogue regularly aren't that familiar with the stories in the book of Judges. Yet Delilah is a well-known figure, and she's well-known for being seductive and a temptress. Delilah is all about sex. She's all about sex from the beginning uh, because um, her story comes in a series of stories about Samson having sex with inappropriate women. It's the history of how Delilah has been interpreted because artists and uh, poets and writers have always loved wicked women. Well, the Delilah story is, of course, the Samson story, and understanding where Samson sits in the Book of Judges is a very important thing, it seems to me. The Book of Judges uh, begins by telling you this is not going to be a happy, upbeat story. Israeli's strongman Samson had a weakness for harlots and foreign women. <laughs> when he spotted the beautiful stranger Delilah, his hormones went into overdrive. <laughs> they became an item. <laughs> Samson had a secret, the source of his superhuman strength. The Philistines wanted to take him down and offered Delilah pieces of silver to discover his secret. <laughs> she used her womanly wiles. Twice Samson lied, but the third time, Samson spilled. He'd promised God to never cut his hair. As he slept, Delilah took his hair, and with it, his power. Delilah becomes a uh, kind of a synonym for, this, for the powerful seductress, the powerful temptress, who will use a man for her own purposes. There are references, oh, she's a Delilah. And it refers to a type of woman who will manipulate and exploit and take advantage of a man who's vulnerable in some way. There seems to be a tendency among readers and interpreters and people on the street to put all of these women from the Hebrew Bible, from the New Testament, into the category of prostitute when the biblical stories give no justification for it whatsoever. 
by placing her story right after the story of the prostitute, um, the assumption is easily made by the readers that Delilah's a prostitute as well. The text never calls her that. The text never names her as a prostitute. She's just Delilah, and she's a woman who lives in the Valley of Sorek. And the Valley of Sorek is border country between the Philistines and the Israelites. As described in the Book of Judges, 13th century BC Israel was a loosely knit union with military men like Samson in leadership roles. His downfall at Delilah's hands would pave the way for a new society ruled by kings. Delilah was an outsider from the Valley of Sorek on Israel's southern border with Philistia. What I think um, we are meant to understand is that she is some kind of foreigner. She is in some way an enemy to the Jewish people or to the nation of Israel. So she is an outsider that is a threat. The whole story takes place in the context of an ongoing conflict between Israel and the Philistines where the Israelites are struggling to free themselves from Philistine domination. And when Samson was uh, conceived, it was predicted that he would be the one to begin to free the Israelites from Philistine oppression. So at the point where he meets Delilah, uh, he falls in love with her, and her compatriots see in this an opportunity to finally bring Israel down by finding a way to rob him of his strength. I think in some sense, one could read it metaphorically as that very common thread in the Hebrew scriptures, which is if one would mix with the other, with the foreign woman, that Israel is losing its sort of purity and its chosenness. And so it's always a warning against uh, any kind of mixing with the other. This is an interpretation that has been suggested that the cutting of the hair is a symbolic castration. His power which is the kind of an amplification of masculine power, is completely removed from him by the act of, of cutting his hair. Of course, it takes two to tango. Now, Samson may have been a strong man physically, but he sure wasn't leading the dance intellectually. She tells him right away, right from the start, what she wants. Tell me how it is that you're so strong so that you can be bound. What, tell me what it is that makes you so strong so that we can make that go away and you won't be strong anymore. Samson has never seemed to me to be the sharpest knife in the toolbox or the brightest star in the sky or however you, you would, you know, whatever metaphor you'd want to use. What always strikes me is that he doesn't seem that concerned with the fate of his people. Samson clearly has no great deep um, admiration for women. He sleeps with prostitutes. He um, causes his first uh, betrothed to be burnt alive with her household. So this is not someone with a uh, deep appreciation for the female sa sex or a, a great love for them. And so um, she puts herself in danger for this. And I think that to do so for um, economic gain is not uh, a, a crime, necessarily. Even though the text does not clearly say that Delilah was a harlot, it's very definite about the fact that Samson visited prostitutes. And that wasn't the worst of his bad boy behavior. <laughs> when she maneuvered Samson into telling her the secret of his strength and chopped his hair, Delilah became one of the most notorious women of the Bible often distracting readers from Samson's bad behavior. There's a, a measure of narcissism to Samson, where he's always, instead of looking towards God, he's turning him, his, his, his eye inwards to himself. And this is ultimately his downfall. Samson, who seems more or less oblivious to the fate of his people and to his important role as a judge, and he just follows women around. He falls in love with women all the time unsuitable ones, usually the daughters of his enemies. And every time, he loses, but he keeps on doing this. He has no sense of delayed gratification, that you can want something and don't get to have it right away, uh, which is something we have to teach our children, 
but uh, Samson never seems to have learned that. Uh, whenever he wants something, he wants it now. He's like a, he's like a teenage boy. Samson is one of these uh, figures who is so caught up in his brute strength. He'd be equivalent nowadays to men who spend a lot of time in the gym and look in the mirror to see themselves, you know, build their muscles. This was not a guy you'd want as a next door neighbor. He doesn't seem to act in a way that we would consider particularly godly or uh, appropriate. He, he likes swine, women, uh, rude jokes, uh, carousing. Uh, he sets, like, set people on fire quite happily. Um, and he's like an overgrown child. I think it's a very, very violent culture that he's in and that the only way to save your people is to slaughter your enemy. But he becomes obsessed with the slaughter. In fact, Samson's rap sheet was a mile long. He's not supposed to drink. He's supposed to live a very holy life. He is a judge of Israel. At the same time, he's going to harlots in, uh, in Philistia. He's just following women around uh, against the judgment of all the people around him. Yet he's a leader of Israel. He doesn't seem particularly wise in, in, any, in any matter. Samson is not the man in the Bible who I personally would pick as, as being a reliable breadwinner. So if I were in a relationship with Samson, I would want to have my own bank account. And what a temper. Furious at an attempt to turn him over to his enemies, the Philistines, Whoa. Samson broke free, grabbed the jawbone of a donkey, and started swinging. The Bible says he killed 1,000 men. So he does these foolish things, but at the same time, it's also a humorous story about the stupidity of the Philistines, who are able to be killed in their thousands by a man wielding a donkey's jawbone. A hero in Israel for his strength. By the time Samson met Delilah, <laughs> he was public enemy number one for the Philistines. And after two decades of apparently going straight, Samson was drawn back into what's clearly his sexual obsession, <laughs> sex with foreign women and preferably paid sex. I think perhaps Samson underestimates women. And it's not that they are wicked, seductresses, but that he fails to see that they are actually a force to be reckoned with in the world, and that their force is often verbal or linguistic, and that he doesn't take this into account. And so Samson, um, this is another of his failures by emphasizing the vulnerability of women. He makes use of women as prostitutes. And by underestimating them, he ultimately is unable to overpower the female. And it's not due to any deceptive power in the female. When Samson fell in love with the beautiful Delilah, he fell hard. With this woman who's not identified as a prostitute, but was a foreigner. From the Valley of Sorek, it's hard to understand why he so foolishly reveals his truth. And this is why, historically, Delilah is seen as this great seductress. There must be something about Delilah that is so above and beyond all women that, uh, he, that he cannot resist her. And in the art world, Delilah is often shown as in very erotic and sexually, physically seducing him. In scripture, there's no emphasis on her physically seducing him. It's her words that are emphasized, that she uh, is sort of rhetorically very powerful and persuasive, and that he succumbs to this rhetorical, um, that her rhetorical thrusts overpower his physical thrusts, and that he, he, can, he succumbs to this. When Delilah agreed to uncover the secret of Samson's strength and disarm him, history blamed her for Samson's downfall. For centuries, that was the common interpretation. But it's not the only one. Delilah has been known as a bad girl ever since she extracted from Samson the secret of his superhuman powers and then disempowered him by cutting his hair. But was it all her fault? In, in terms of interpreting scripture and in terms of instead of reading with the text, you can read against the text. And, and say, well, is there another way of reading this character? Perhaps you could see her as a woman who wanted to provide for her own 
and uh, a woman who takes initiative, who does what she can to get what she wants, and maybe that's a woman you should laud because there's a woman of power and, and using everything she has to get what she needs and wants. What I love is that the stories allow you to imagine both Samson and Delilah as real people with a, a complex emotions that compete with each other and sometimes undermine each other as well. And I would imagine, maybe I'm too much um, influenced here by the, uh, the film, uh, Samson and Delilah, that Samson either was so tired of being nagged by women and nagged by Delilah that he just gave in, or he simply, against his better judgment, began to trust her with tragic results. What if the person judging the scene of Delilah cutting Samson's hair is not an Israelite, but a Philistine? <laughs> so how, what are we to make of Samson? And indeed, what are we to make of Delilah? Um, certainly, there seems to be a strong idea that at one level, she's simply behaving as a Philistine should, which from a Hebrew point of view is a bad thing, but I imagine from a Philistine point of view is a thoroughly noble thing uh, to do. So, as a Philistine, Delilah may have been fighting to preserve her own faith in multiple gods and goddesses against the Israelites' view of one god with a capital G. I mean, in terms of uh, what the peoples generally believed about the gods, the Israelites, of course, are in the course of this story. They're on their way from polytheism towards the idea of one god. And certainly the Mosaic Party, if we can call them that, are advocating the leadership. People like Joshua are advocating that. But even at the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua has to ask the people whether they're now going to leave their other gods behind or not. So there is a what we nowadays would call pluralism, although the Bible would not look well on that kind of pluralism. Um, in the Judges period, therefore, you have a people of Israel who are themselves unsure about this religious business. And you also have peoples in the territory into which they're entering in the surrounding countries, all of whom uh, have pantheons of gods. And they may have this or that god who's more important, but it's certainly a plethora of gods. It's not one. So the, one of the dynamics of the story surrounds the struggle between an emerging monotheism on the one side and a fairly traditional polytheism on the other. In this religious struggle, the Philistines were mortal enemies of the Jews, and Samson had killed many. So, the lords of Philistia paid Delilah to uncover the secret of Samson's superhuman strength. She's smack in the middle of a political war. We have to remember in those days that things like marriage and so on were not simply matters for individuals. It wasn't about feelings and romance. These things were all tied up with society, with economics, with inheritance, with political treaties, and so on. And so the various biblical injunctions against marrying, you know, with the foreign peoples are not uh, to be thought of as fundamentally, I think, about ethnicity issues. It's fundamentally about political issues, allegiance issues, if you like. And the gods were entirely tied up with that. So. You know, to marry into a family or to be involved in a sexual relationship in this way also involved the question quite quickly as to which gods you were worshipping. After Samson lost his power, he was blinded and paraded through the streets, finally to the Temple of Dagon, the Philistine god of fertility. He becomes a wonderfully tragic figure Whereas earlier on in the Samson saga, he comes off a little bit as a buffoon. In the end, he redeems himself completely. There, God gave him back his strength, and Samson brought the temple down on the Philistines and on himself. But what happened to the beautiful Delilah? Over centuries, Delilah became a symbol and lesson to both men and women about the power of female sexuality. I think Delilah is one of the women who did use her beauty and her feminine wiles uh, to uh, get her way with men. And certainly that's how she's been interpreted in the 19th century by women. Harriet Beecher Stowe has a piece on Delilah, 
and she portrays Delilah as a very wicked woman, and she's the kind of woman whose life is a lesson for the rest of us. But Samson does get that chance to bring down the temple on the Philistines. But in the end, you know, he redeems himself in some fashion uh, in terms of at least taking measures to free his people from Philistine domination, which was the promise given to his parents when uh, he was conceived to begin with. He's the Rambo figure of the Book of Judges, it seems to me. You know, he, he goes in guns blazing, but the trouble is, uh, you know, it's rather indiscriminate, you might say. And um, he's not visibly somebody living by God's law which is the larger context of the story, of course. But Moses has given God's law. The reader inevitably is measuring the various characters against that standard. And by that standard, Samson falls fairly short. And he ends his life, of course, in an act of personal revenge, essentially. Um, and uh, I think you're, you're left wondering what you're supposed to make of this character. He has focused on the physical. He has turned his way from God's truth. And so I think it's a consequence. And Delilah is an instrument used to bring about that consequence. Some scholars believe that Delilah was in the temple when Samson brought it down, and the lovers perished together. But that's just a theory. Harlot or heroin? Delilah was most likely a political tool. The whole book ends after Samson in, uh, in societal dysfunction of a fairly marked kind, brutality and barbarism. And the author eventually throws his hands up in the air and says, you know, everyone who was doing what was right in his own eyes uh, because there was no king in the land. So the entire way of governing the people is up for grabs by the end of the book of Judges. And that's what the story seems to be about. Now, of course, Israel ends up with a monarchy including King David and King Solomon. And so the book of Judges, in a way, prepares the reader for that move. This is why it was necessary. Really, it wasn't ideal. But in the end, these judges were so problematic, to put it nicely, as leaders, that there was no choice. Israelite society was not going to continue because here we have a judge who's just running around after women and not doing his job as a judge. Delilah was most certainly an instrument in Samson's spiritual resurrection. Beyond that, a significant chapter of Israeli history may well be built on the story of this notorious woman, Delilah. When King David saw her bathing naked on the roof, this married temptress drew the great king so powerfully that he risked everything, including his salvation. At least that's the guy's version. On the side of her being the seductress, people have said in the past, well, why was she bathing on top of the roof? Um, and she was, she purposely positioned herself there because she knew that King David would be um, walking around on his balcony. This has been a very common um, interpretation of this story, that somehow Bathsheba uh, kept tabs on David, that she didn't like her own husband or was looking to trade him in for a more powerful model. And in, so she uh, set it up so that she would seduce David from afar. Until the 1960s, the common interpretation of Bathsheba's story wasn't exactly pro-woman. While her husband was away at war, <laughs> the beautiful Bathsheba decided to take a bath on the roof of her home, aware that King David was watching from across the way. Smitten, the king sent his minions to Bathsheba's door with an invitation to a command performance at the palace. This was not smart. Given that both were married, and in those days, women could be stoned for adultery, God was so not well pleased. But who's to blame? Was Bathsheba really a naughty temptress? Interpreters over the years, over the centuries, have uh, 
wondered, because there's so many gaps in the story, whether Bathsheba went out onto the roof in the, of her house in the evening, specifically because she knew David liked to uh, take a stroll there, and that therefore she was setting herself up to be seen and desired by him. And, and probably the best example of this is the, the film, the 1950s film, David and Bathsheba, um, where you have poor David who is, you know, distracted by the business of kings and he happens to see Bathsheba bathing and she appears to be making quite a show of it. And she looks over her shoulder uh, at the camera and uh, we know that that's what, what she's looking, she's looking at David and very aware of him looking at her. So uh, poor David is distracted, sends for her, and uh, as the, the scene progresses, she eventually admits that um, she has in fact been desirous of David all along, put herself in, in full view of him. Um, and by the end of the story, it's she who's actually suggesting that if, if she could, if King David could, could do something about the little problem of, uh, of her husband, then she'd be free to, um, to, be, uh, to be his. More recently, um, interpreters, particularly women interpreters, have looked at that story and uh, said, well, that's a very male fantasy, isn't it? That this woman um, would uh, structure her life around trying to capture this man. Here is a woman who wants to simply have a bath on her roof. It's very common in this culture for a woman to do that. It was springtime. They collected rainwater on the roof. Uh, it was very um, cool in the late evening, and so it was a good time to take a bath on the roof. And she cannot presume that people are going to go out on their, uh, their own rooftops and telescopically look down at her and want to know more about her. So I see her as this woman simply taking a bath. He, kings being kings, he decides he wants her. And we already know from the text itself that t kings get what kings want. So he sends for and takes Bathsheba. And she comes, how is she to say no? He's the king. This was the golden age of Israel, 1000 BC. And David was the golden boy. The son of a shepherd who faced down the giant Goliath and killed him with a slingshot. A major turning point in the war between Israel and the Philistines. David became an army commander, ultimately conquering the Philistines and establishing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. At just 30 years old, this war hero was chosen by his country's elders to be the second king of a united Israel. David's life story shows how even the great must obey God's laws. He had been king for several years and several wives when he met Bathsheba. And he's being described at this point in the story as being very successful, being the king uh, after God's own heart. There's no reason to think he's suddenly going to go off the rails, as it were. And uh, so the story, particularly how abruptly it's introduced, is, is fairly striking, I think. When David spied Bathsheba on that roof, her husband Uriah was away fighting for his country. Why wasn't the king? The story does not explicitly tell us why David is still in Jerusalem, but it does make a pretty strong hint that there's something wrong with him being there because uh, 2 Samuel 11 begins by telling us in the springtime, at the time when kings go to war, David stayed in Jerusalem which is puzzling to begin with anyway as to why he would be sending everyone else off to war and he stays behind. Whatever put him at the scene, pre-feminist interpreters were all but unanimous about where to lay the blame for what happened next. Modern scholars are not so sure. I don't think she's tempting him and I think she also has no choice when he calls for her. I think of Bathsheba as actually sexually assaulted by David. Uh, not everybody reads the passage in that way, but I think that Bathsheba has no choice but to lay with the king. Otherwise, you're in a great deal of danger. All versions of the story agree on the immediate consequences. So when she becomes pregnant, she realizes immediately that this is going to be her downfall, so that she has to tell King David. When she told the king, it didn't go well. <gasps> oh! 
Well, he already had lots of wives. The story tells that he's got, you know, a number of wives that he collected along the way as he was rising to power. But the problem here is that he has lain with the wife of one of his army officers, and this is not a good thing. And that's when things fall apart for David. He is caught, and he has to um, cover up the deed. So the first attempt is to uh, call Uriah back and try to persuade him to sleep with his wife, because if Uriah will sleep with his wife, and then everyone realizes that she's pregnant, well, you know, it'll all, the child will all obviously be taken as Uriah's. In the biblical story, he refuses out of solidarity for the troops, uh, for the other soldiers that are sleeping in the field and roughing it. Uh, how can he come home and sleep with his wife and, and enjoy those pleasures when others are not able to do so. So he's very noble and he refuses. For one night with Bathsheba, the king had betrayed a loyal soldier. Will he murder for her? Bathsheba was pregnant with his child when Israel's beloved King David made her his queen. But hold on. She was already married when she met David, to a soldier named Uriah. Uriah was one of David's mighty men. He was an honorable man, someone that any woman in that time would have wanted to be married to. Uh, he was someone who was so honorable that when David tried to cover up his uh, affair with Bathsheba and invite Uriah back to sleep with his wife so as to cover up the, the paternity, um, that Uriah said, no, because my fellow men are at war, how can I enjoy my pleasure when they are um, at war? Uriah is deliberately sent by David to the front lines, um, uh, obviously as a way, hopefully, of, of having him killed off and removed from the story, and that's exactly what happens. He's set up so that David can keep his hands clean. Uh, David doesn't actually, you know, thrust a, a sword into his belly or, or, you know, poison his wine or anything like that. But David is just as much guilty of his murder as the mob boss is who orders a hit on somebody. He puts the plan into motion. Uh, he, he thinks, he organizes it. He tells his loyal uh, henchman, Joab, what to do and he sets him up. He gets one of his generals to put uh, Uriah right at the front of the action, sets him up so that he's killed. And uh, then Bathsheba can become the next wife in the royal household. She mourns his death, but then she's willing, even though she d may not love David, she has had a child with David. She realizes perhaps that she has very few options as a widow. And so she is willing to be integrated into his household. And therefore, thereafter, negotiates, start negotiating the place for herself and the place for her son. For David, this episode with Bathsheba really is the turning point of his rule. Uh, from now on, David's family is going to be under attack and he is going to face some family situations which really no father or no husband wants to face. God was not pleased with David and sent the prophet Nathan to tell him so in the form of a rather tricky parable. Well, Nathan comes to confront David about what he's done with Bathsheba, but he doesn't do it directly. Um, he tries to draw David into implicating himself. So he tells him a story about a rich man who had many possessions, including many sheep and cattle, and a poor man who just had the one lamb. And uh, somebody comes to visit the rich man. The rich man insists on using the poor man's one sheep as a meal for the visitor. And of course, this outrages David, and he says, well, somebody who steals something like that from a poor man must surely die. And Nathan, of course, jumps on that and says, you've done exactly that with Uriah. You've taken this poor man's wife, uh, even though you are a king with, with all of these riches and resources. David would be punished through his children, his dynasty. The child he conceived with Bathsheba lived only seven days. This is a terrible punishment for David to lose a male heir. 
is because that is uh, uh, someone that could rule for him. So it's not a daughter that he loses, it's a son. And that is God's way of showing that his inheritance is lessened in some way. Uh, but this is also, of course, a punishment for Bathsheba. It is her son as well. And he goes through a real period of lament. He recognizes his sin. He fasts. He throws himself on the ground. He won't. So he, he is really repentant for the sin that he commits. But he, God will not allow him to um, go unscathed. He must have uh, a punishment for uh, taking this little lamb of the one you know, poor man instead of uh, be, being with and, and using his own little lambs. What the loss of the child does is it brings a turning point in the relationship between Bathsheba and David. And there's an interesting verse that says that after that happened, David comforted his wife and Bathsheba conceived. Bathsheba produced another son. This one, Solomon grew up to be as famous as his father and as troubled. And Solomon is hope for his mother because he's not only named Solomon, but the prophet Nathan gives him a name, Jedediah, which means beloved of the Lord. And so here Bathsheba is affirmed. Um, she is someone who has come through loss, but has hope for her future. Bathsheba all but disappeared from the story for what amounts to years. We don't know what happens to Bathsheba uh, between the birth of Solomon and Solomon um, actually becoming king or about to become king. And that's, again, very typical of uh, Hebrew narrative style. Uh, Hebrew narrative style only uh, introduces characters when it needs them. And if she's not needed in the story, then we don't hear anything about her. Uh, it doesn't mean that she's not there. It doesn't mean that she's not doing whatever she needs to do. In fact, behind the scenes, Bathsheba was one busy lady. After Bathsheba gave birth to King David's son Solomon, she never looked back, but began a transition from victim to political powerhouse. She had three more children with David, but it was Solomon she worked to get on the throne. We have to remember that in uh, the ancient world uh, that women's status was usually determined by the status of the man to whom they were most closely linked. And for Bathsheba, uh, that would be through her sons. The point is that if you're not the queen mother, then you're nobody and you're cast aside and you have to fend for yourself. As the king aged, the dysfunctional family he built exploded into bitter rivalry over who would be the next king of Israel. There was no love lost between rival half-brothers Adonijah by another of David's wives and Solomon, Bathsheba's child. Both from the ancient text itself as well as from sociological looks at monarchies, um, the time when uh, the factions are fighting for the throne is a very dangerous time. What we do know, and we see again here in this story, is that the queens, so the royal household of the queens, begin to play those politics. And if they're a powerful figure, they can help get one of their sons on the throne. When King David took to his deathbed, Bathsheba made her most controversial move, and this one was all hers. She reminded King David of a promise he'd made to see their son Solomon take the throne. But did he ever actually make that promise? There's a very mysterious promise that David is alleged to have made, which is resurrected in 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, which doesn't visibly appear earlier in the story. And I think you're left to wonder how much of this is the king being reminded in his dotage of something that, in fact, he never said. Even if Bathsheba was once a victim, she was now fully in charge of her destiny and her sons. And so Bathsheba comes back into the story because she is vying to get her son Solomon on the throne. And in the, as David is dying, we have a very interesting portrait where she lines up with a priest and a prophet. 
And that coalition, I mean, they're, they're portrayed in the story as three individuals, the queen, the priest, and the prophet. But what they represent most probably is three factions. So she's got a priestly faction and a prophetic faction behind her. And they line up to get Solomon on the throne. So while the initial take on Bathsheba is pretty opaque, it looks like she's sort of a pawn of David in being taken as kind of a royal concubine. By the end of her time, she ends up being the most powerful queen because she gets her son Solomon on the throne. Solomon took his father's place as king of Israel. With her son on the throne, Bathsheba's position <laughs> was unassailable. She meets Solomon to ask him for something and he goes to meet her. He bows before her. He sits down on his throne and then he calls people to set up a throne for Bathsheba. And so here Bathsheba is not just another one of David's wives after his death. She's not just the mother of the king, but she is the queen mother. Bathsheba had transformed herself from plaything to powerhouse. When her son Solomon became king of Israel, Bathsheba proved to be a surprisingly benevolent queen mum. By the end of the story of Bathsheba, she is someone who has grown, has matured. She's no longer passive, very active, a complex character, and she is a woman to be respected and to be reckoned with. In the popular romantic versions of the story of Bathsheba, so much is lost including the relevance to our lives today. Bathsheba's involvement with David is such that it points to a flaw or a weakness in David's character. Uh, David is at a point, a high point of his career. Um, we've seen this in our culture, somebody in ministry, they have money, they have everything, and then they're uh, faced with a situation of temptation and they, they take because they can and they think they're, they're at, um, there are no consequences for them. But in the situation of David, um, there's many, there, in many ways, this is the beginning of the unraveling of David and his kingdom because he never recovers fully from this. There, there will be repercussions in his life and the life of his family. A really a heroic story of a woman who perhaps was sexually assaulted, who had to um, work with a uh, very powerful man and uh, work through her relationship with him no matter what her feelings were towards him and ultimately have her own son some the flesh of her flesh become the most powerful figure in israel and so seeing it today a woman who's who's in a bad situation who's at the mercy in some ways of powerful men in her life who does what she has to do in order to survive. And it may not be admirable of what she has to do, and we might not agree with what she does, but she's the best judge of what she needs to do to ensure her own survival. Far from being a seductive temptress, Bathsheba was helpless before the king's desire. But over the years of her marriage, she grew into a political powerhouse who built a dynasty. Who would have thought that Bathsheba, another man's wife, turned widow, uh, and now a wife of the king of Israel, would have become such a beloved character, would have been the mother of Israel's wisest and arguably greatest king. Jezebel. Her name in a modern dictionary is the very definition of a wicked, shameless woman. Jezebel, she is the archetypal villain. She is the most sort of evil woman in the Bible. She is held up uh, as the example of what woman can be if you allow woman to have power. They will destroy, they will emasculate. And so we have this saying, you know, in contemporary language of so-and-so is a Jezebel. And, you know, what they mean by that is a, a woman who is, I don't know, promiscuous, um, but also um, controlling, uh, a bit of a harpy, I suppose. <laughs> 
the text portrays her as a wicked woman who fights against uh, the God of Israel. So it's a them against us. Jezebel was a princess from Phoenicia who married the Israeli king Ahab. She was a faithful follower of Baal, the pagan god of fertility. Jezebel's Israeli husband tolerated his bride's religion, even allowing an altar in Baal's name to be built at the palace. God wow. was not amused. And sent his prophet Elijah to confront the royal couple. Jezebel fought back, and heads rolled. Many, many heads. Not very ladylike. It's a story about the dangers of mixing, right? The dangers of of impure religion or impure practice. And they're also interested in really working with these ideas around sexuality and foreignness um, and the worship of idols and that sort of thing. In the late 800s BC, the Middle East was in turmoil. To keep from being swallowed up by the powerful Assyrians, Israel built alliances with her neighbors. Even after the reign of wise King Solomon, many Israelites were still drawn to paganism. There would be harsh consequences, dramatically illustrated in 1st and 2nd Kings with the story of Jezebel. Jezebel was actually a princess from one of the Phoenician city-states. And so she would have grown up in a royal household and was married in an arranged marriage between that city-state and the uh, royal family in Israel. So she came into Israel as a queen and was quite powerful. Most of those royal households would have had multiple wives. Almost every king that we know of in the ancient world had more than one wife because all of those marriages were political. Kings married in order to form political alliances both within their own state, say with powerful families that they wanted to marry into, or with these international alliances. And so uh, the story takes place in a situation where we have a, a, a really strong division between the northern and the southern kingdoms. And often in the biblical account of this time period, it's written from a southern perspective. So the people in the north and the kings of the north and the queens of the north are portrayed in a negative light because they're in a conflict with the people in the south. Jezebel is a great Phoenician woman, right? She's, she's very loyal to her own faith, um, and she's loyal to her own kingdom. And, you know, marriages were made to make political alliances. Was she a good Israelite woman? No. <laughs> when Jezebel became queen of Israel, she brought more than political power. She brought her own pagan belief system. The wider religious context of that story goes back to the pretty widely shared polytheism of the ancient world. Different cultures surrounding Israel had different names for their various gods, but fundamentally the religious structure was very similar. And Baal, the god Baal, who lies at the heart of the story, that is actually an abbreviated uh, form of a much longer title, Baal Hadad. So the god is Hadad. The word Baal simply means Lord, and the Bible abbreviates this simply to Baal. Hadad is the storm god. He's a storm god well known across the ancient Near East. So he is the, the god whose job it is to bring the rains, to bring the thunderstorms, to replenish the land, and therefore bring fertility. So the background really to this story is which god controls fertility? Which god controls the rains? Is it Baal Hadad or is it Elijah's god, Yahweh? Modern archaeology takes us into the world of the Ahab and Jezebel story. We also have archaeologically evidence for female figurines, and we call these Astarte plaques or Asherah plaques. It depends on the scholar that's looking at them. We don't quite know exactly how they relate, but they will often depict a woman, uh, often bare-chested, perhaps standing on a lion, perhaps holding snakes, and we find these in the archaeological record. Israelites, especially in the north, were still attracted to the pagan gods, and it's possible that Jezebel was a popular figure with the common people. Perhaps it was resistance to the powerful pull of paganism that led biblical writers to brand Jezebel as, well, as a Jezebel, evil personified. People who did not 
loyally follow the religion of Yahweh and Yahweh alone. And Ahab and certainly Jezebel fall into the writer's sights as evil characters. And so they write the story that way. They put their theological understanding on the story. So when you read the story in First and Second Kings, Jezebel comes off as a bad character. Jezebel certainly had influence with King Ahab. After their marriage, he allowed his beautiful wife to erect an altar in the palace, an <laughs> altar to the pagan god Baal. <laughs> so far, Jezebel's really done nothing wrong, except marry a king and remain true to her faith. But she's not called Jezebel for nothing. When Jezebel married Israel's King Ahab, and influenced him to promote her pagan faith, she was on a collision course with the Hebrew prophet Elijah, and this was not a woman to back away from a fight. She had some run-ins with a prophet named Elijah, uh, who was uh, giving Ahab a run for his money about uh, some of the things Ahab was doing. And uh, Jezebel, on at least a couple of occasions, apparently didn't like what Elijah had done and also didn't like the way King Ahab was dealing with Elijah. Jezebel imported 450 priests of the god Baal into Israel. And for a while, it was party time for pagans. Cross-cultural marriage like that, the queen would probably come with some of her own retinue and probably maybe even a priest from her own religion, and it would be tolerated in the regime into which she married. For Jews, Baal worship was akin to Satan worship for Christians today. Still, the actual text of the Book of Kings painted a dark enough picture of Jezebel without the leap made in later interpretations, that she was a prostitute. As a queen, I really doubt that she would have done much to undermine her power. And, you know, queens didn't need to act as a prostitute. They had all kinds of power already. But it also fits the picture of the disparagement of a foreign queen. If you want to uh, be, you know, rally the troops around those who are most loyal, then anybody who's foreign is automatically suspect. And one of the things, one of the ways you can always discount women is to, to question their morals. One of Jezebel's most notorious traits being stronger than her husband, the king. Jezebel is a very interesting character in her own right. She's presented as an extraordinarily strong character, first of all. That is the most striking thing about Jezebel. Ahab is presented as a very weak king. Uh, he spends most of the story doing what other people tell him, actually. Women are what we would certainly call oppressed. Um, they are considered to be second-class citizens. And so what the stories do with women is interesting. They do one of two things. They ignore them. And so we have very few stories about women of that time period because they were just, if you will, part of the scenery. Or if they were powerful women, then they were written into the stories. But often, powerful women were written into the stories as evil. Jezebel ordered many Hebrew prophets murdered. And when the prophet Elijah went to the king to try to get him back on track with God, King Ahab would have none of it. What? Ahab had clearly gone over to the other side, and Elijah must do something dramatic to get him out of the clutches of Jezebel and her pagan gods. It was showdown time on Mount Carmel. The challenge, which faith could set alight a sacrificial altar and prompt the end of a devastating drought. Elijah begins the story by announcing a drought that's highly significant. Elijah shows by doing that his God is real, has the power to bring a drought. Um, in the story as it develops on Mount Carmel, the prophets of Baal you know, try to get their God to deliver rain. He's completely unable to do so. So that's where the religious ideologies clash. And this is really a contest, if you like, between gods as to who proves himself to be a real god and which of the gods are simply fictions. Jezebel's 450 pagan prophets performed a hopping dance for an entire day. 
nothing happened. Then Elijah prayed to the Hebrew God, and immediately the altar was consumed by fire. I think it's written to, as, a, as a fairly direct piece of polemic against pagan polytheism. Uh, Elijah goes out of his way not just to show that Baal is no god, but actually to make fun of Baal. There's a fair bit of satire in this story. And so I think the story is really designed to show the Hebrew reader that Yahweh is real and these other gods are in fact not. In the end, it was Yahweh, big G God, who won the day. Elijah showed no mercy and executed the pagan priests. In the story itself, Jezebel is blamed as being a thoroughly bad person, but in some ways she's also respected as being a very strong person. I mean, she is the main character in the story, it seems to me. She's the main opponent of Elijah, and she's formidable enough to get Elijah to turn tail and run at a certain point in the story. So she's blamed, but she's not trivialized, if I can put it that way. After the showdown of Mount Carmel, Elijah fled the country, afraid of the wrath of the powerful Jezebel. After years as queen of Israel, Jezebel had become an unstoppable force, ruling even the king. Various points in her story along the way have, have to do with, um, <laughs> you know, her, her very kind of emasculated, weak uh, husband, Ahab, um, who, you know, wants a vineyard for a vegetable garden or something like this and can't get it, so he pouts. The king coveted a vineyard belonging to one of his countrymen. When the man refused to sell it, Jezebel took charge. Jezebel got a bad rap, but part of it was deserved and particularly in the story of what we call Naboth's Vineyard. And it's a story where you really see a characterization of Jezebel as a powerful queen, a powerful actor who takes charge. Her husband is moaning and groaning and very sad, sorry for himself that he can't get the vineyard of Naboth. And she said, I'll get that for you. And the, the background to the story is it takes place in uh, Jezreel, which is the summer capital for the uh, dynasty. It also happened to be the second palace for this dynasty. And so the king apparently wants to take over a vineyard that's next or near the palace. And the reason Naboth won't sell is because that vineyard is really not his to sell. It is owned probably by his extended family. And land tenure in ancient Israel, as far as we understand it, for peasants and just regular landowners, land was held by an extended family. How Jezebel got the vineyard will forever brand her as an evil, scheming, heartless woman. And Jezebel just says, in essence, you wimp, I'm going to get you that land. And apparently she has no scruples uh, about just doing anything necessary to allow the royal family to take over land. So she concocts a scene where she gets the elders of Jezreel to bring a fraudulent charge against Naboth, that he has cursed the king and cursed God, which was, at least as the story was written, was apparently a capital offense, and so he could be stoned. So there's a feast, and the elders of the city bring this fraudulent charge against Naboth. Everybody believes it. He is taken out and stoned. She um, does arrange uh, for the death of Naboth um, in a very unjust and cruel way, but she does allow for that so her husband can have what he wants. Now, you could read that. Uh, you could read it in a way that um, Jezebel is a Lady Macbeth this horrible Lady Macbeth that says, aren't you a man? You must be a man. You must fight for what you want. Don't let yourself be pushed around. And, and in some ways, if a man did that, that might be seen as heroic. She completely undermines any legal processes. So yeah, she's a bad character. Now, she's probably no better and no worse than any other king who wanted to take the land of peasants. They found nefarious ways to do that. They were in charge. They were the king. And if it wasn't outright seizure, then they did a variety of other ways to undermine the peasants' ability to hold on to their land. So 
yes, she's evil, but again, she's no more evil nor less evil than other kings and queens of the time. But certainly, she's evil. I agree. And now, Jezebel had truly unleashed the wrath of God. The prophet Elijah returned to Israel to warn the king that he must pay for his sins and that a truly terrible fate awaits his pagan queen, the powerful Jezebel. King Ahab repented, and God spared him in his lifetime, but denied his ambitions for dynasty. Queen Jezebel survived her husband. There was warfare going on at the time between her husband's dynasty and a neighboring state. The king eventually lost his life in one of those wars, but she was powerful enough as the queen to become what in that term time was called the queen mother. And so two of her sons succeeded her husband on the throne. But where there is no repentance, there would be no forgiveness. And a day of reckoning comes when a particular army officer named Jehu is anointed by one of the prophets to be the new king. He uh, kills the reigning king, which is one of uh, Jezebel's sons, and uh, manages to slaughter the whole royal family and in a coup, seize power. And his uh, final act in terms of getting rid of the previous dynasty is to kill Jezebel. Even with her husband and sons dead, Jezebel was too powerful and dangerous to live. Uh, archaeologists have found the place where um, Jezebel probably stood. You can stand on the, 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 the tell, the archaeological mound where this place was, and you can look over the Jezreel Valley and imagine Jehu coming quickly in his chariot. And her death scene is very heroic. She beautifies herself. She's very much like Cleopatra. She puts on her makeup, stands by the window, and accuses Jehu of being an assassin and as uh, associates him through illusion with a, an assassin. So she's very courageous, even as she's thrown out of the window and trampled to death by the horses and her blood spatters everywhere. Can we say that she's wholly virtuous? No, but here's a woman who stands up for her religious beliefs. She believes in Baal, and she wants to fight for her gods. Now, from a Jewish perspective, a biblical perspective, that's the wrong thing to do. But within her own belief system, she is trying to be a pious follower of her religious beliefs. Within the Jezebel and Ahab story, the message is simple. Without faith in God, one true God, there is no chance of salvation. The story in the Old Testament is not there to teach religious tolerance, but to teach the lesson that the God of Israel is the true God. And uh, you need, you know, that you're always given the, the choice. You follow God or Baal or Yahweh, and, and uh, you're given a choice. And it's not both and. A Judite community was struggling for its own power um, in the Persian Empire. And so to be able to create uh, stories and legends and uh, about how uh, they are pure and foreigners are problems is one of the strains of thought in the post-exilic period. And the Jezebel story plays right into that because she can be seen as a power holder who's a foreign queen who was really nasty. You've got these stories from an earlier text that make her look that way, and it plays right into that. So, modern meditations on Jezebel's story turn up this other food for thought about our human tendency, when the going gets tough, to look for villains outside our own tribe. A figure like Jezebel becomes perfect for the kind of black and white thinking, there's no gray in the middle, you're either completely evil and you're going to hell in a handbasket when God comes back to set everything right, or you're completely good. Well, I don't think she was any better or any worse than any queen of her day. Be that as it may, the writers write her story so that she becomes the foil of evil. Then what happens is her story begins to live on, if you will, outside of the pages of First and Second Kings. And over centuries, the name Jezebel became synonymous with harlot, harridan, hussy, but the biblical character herself is better described as fierce, formidable, 
and pagan. She won the throne in a beauty contest. But Esther is one beauty queen who earned her people's respect, even if it took centuries. Sometimes um, critics have called Esther, the Book of Esther, um, a work that contains a Miss Persia contest. It's like a Donald Trump contest where somebody has to come and be the most beautiful sort of woman. Jews have celebrated Esther's story with the Festival of Purim. And some experts believe the story was actually written to explain the festival. It's traditionally a lighthearted affair, with celebrants dressing up as the characters in the story. And this is a very, it's a very fun story, but it's a very body story in a way. And there's all sorts of hints of, of extreme drunkenness, elaborate feasts, seduction, all of these hints of things that we don't necessarily think of when we think of biblical stories from Sunday school, but they're all there. I think the character of Esther herself has been looked at in a negative light by a lot of scholars, by a number of scholars, who don't expect a heroic biblical woman to be engaged in the arts of seduction. King Xerxes of Persia was throwing a party, a big party. A little the worse for wear, he called his beautiful first wife to come and show off in front of his mates, but Queen Vashti refused. So Vashti becomes a woman that, a woman of strength and courage, even if it costs me my life, I will not do this. And so for many women, she becomes the model of defiance. The ancient readers of this would have found this quite comical in that here is this queen refusing to obey his orders. And later feminist thinkers have seen Queen Vashti as being more of a heroic character because she refuses to bow to the patriarchy. Furious at her disobedience, the king took Vashti's crown and advertised for a new queen, beautiful, virginal, and hopefully more compliant. The king is worried and the advisors are worried that if you have a situation where a, a woman can disobey the king, this is going to mean that women all over the region, all over the empire, are going to be disobeying their husbands. So they're greatly concerned about the possibilities of the social order collapsing here. I think in, in ancient autocratic societies, as in modern ones, in a way, of course, everyone has choices, but the choices are, realistically speaking, very constrained. Uh, I think if you're summoned to be part of the royal harem, you have a choice, but the choice is probably living or dying. The Jewish courtier Mordecai thought his beautiful cousin Esther could win the crown. Yeah. At his urging, she spent a year getting ready for her audience with the king. Many lovely virgins went before and returned the next morning empty-handed. When it came Esther's turn, the king was smitten. And Esther is not only beautiful in the face, we're told, but she's beautiful in her form. So she has this wonderful body, this wonderful um, facial appearance. She's perfumed for six months and has other beauty treatments for another six months. So for 12 months, she has to become the most pristine, beautiful object, even smelling the olfactory sense of Esther. And so this is what I think he's drawn to. I don't think he sees any depth to Esther, and she, but she can use that beauty as a vehicle oh. of power. And that has nowadays, in modern terms, this is now being called erotic capital. She knows how to play the politics of the court. She knows when to appear, when not to appear, how to play her role. She operates in this context very astutely. Feminists uh, scholars often feel uncomfortable with her and other females who use indirect means to achieve their goals or to achieve a measure of authority or power. They prefer figures like Vashti because Vashti um, overtly and ostensibly and directly denies a request of the king. Besides being young and female, Esther was also disadvantaged as a foreigner a young Jewish girl living in exile in Persia around 480 BC. So there are situations where Esther doesn't, you know, she purposely hides the fact that she's Jewish and she's advised to do so and so she hides that fact. A queen like Esther would fit into the social world in a kind of a double way. Because she's part of an oppressed minority, she would be in danger. So that even though she's uh, an elite character, 
uh, her position would not be guaranteed. She could be vulnerable. By bringing her husband news from cousin Mordecai of a plot against the king's life, Esther solidified her position. And this was where the plot thickened. The king's right-hand man, Haman, rounded up the plotters and killed them. He also required everyone to show loyalty by bowing to him. One man refused, Esther's cousin Mordecai. As a Jew, it's against his religion. And so this starts the whole crisis out where Mordecai won't bow for Haman and this just drives Haman nuts for whatever reasons. He just can't stand the idea that somebody is not bowing down before him. So Haman got the king's permission to execute all Persian Jews. Of course, Xerxes didn't realize this meant his beautiful bride. You can read this as a comic story, making fun of the Persian Empire, making fun of this extremely drunk and ill-tempered king who isn't so concerned with his people, but is more interested in feasting and drinking and building a large harem for himself. And he leaves the arts of governance to his advisors. <sighs> Through it all, Esther appeared oblivious, living the good life as the king's favorite. When Mordecai asked Esther to intervene with the king, she was suddenly faced with a momentous choice. Risk her own life or abandon her people to certain death. She won the throne through a beauty contest. Oh. And now Esther's been thrust into politics headfirst, asked to intervene with the king to stop a massacre of Jews. The crisis comes when Mordecai, her uncle, um, is in trouble and her people uh, are at risk and he asks Esther to step up to the plate and she, she knows that uh, she could lose her life by doing this. Uh, one of the initial acts of bravery that she engages in is that she appears before King Ahasuerus without his permission and the book makes us uh, aware that this is a danger for her because we are told that if you do appear before the king without his permission, he can have you executed. Absolute obedience is required. So I think that, that rather totalitarian autocratic context uh, helps to uh, point up by, by way of uh, contrast Esther's courage, for example, in going to see the king. And Mordecai gives her a bit of a pep talk saying, you have to do this, it's important for your people. You're in the same boat as all of us, right? If you don't do this, it's going to be bad for, for all of us, and there will be another deliverer, somebody else will rise up and help us, and so you really have to do this. And so some scholars have taken that as a pivotal moment where Mordecai steps in and shows that he's the real hero. But I think of this more as a literary situation. This builds suspense, this signals to us that what she's doing is heroic, that what she's doing is dangerous, and it provides us uh, a sort of story of, of her internal thought process. Esther took her time, fasting for three days. Yes, I think what is very interesting uh, about Esther is that she does have a legitimate fear. I think this is natural. This is what makes Esther human. This is why both male and female readers should um, come to the book of Esther and, and read it. She's not a one-dimensional character. Fasting is certainly part of Jewish worship, and the fasting that happens in the book of Esther is one of the few overtly religious things in the book. Uh, the book itself uh, really thinks of God as being very much in, in the background, involved. So the fasting is significant, but it's very muted. It's, very, it's a very quiet way of, of implying that these are religious people. Esther actually is thinking very clearly through the consequences of what can happen to her. She realizes that like Vashti, she can also be executed even for entering this inner court. And she wants to weigh the, the benefits and the costs of doing this. So it's almost as if she's undertaking a cost-benefit analysis. Is this something to do? On the third day, Esther dressed in her finery and went to see the king to invite him and Prime Minister Haman to a special banquet at which she'll be asking a favor. At the beginning of Esther, um, Xerxes wants Vashti to come to a feast to be uh, 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 an object to be gazed at. 
Well, actually, Esther gets the king to come to the feast. He becomes the object. She becomes the sub subject. So there's a reversal of roles at these feasts. And through her taking the role of overseer of this um, feast, then Xerxes' mind can be changed. So she fulfills, actually, what um, Vashti couldn't do. At one point, when Haman is favored by the king and invited to Esther's banquet, he goes home and tells everybody about his, his feats and about his honor and how everybody else praises him. And Jewish people will know that only a fool praises himself. And so there's also that anticipation in the audience that this guy is going to come to a sticky end pretty soon. After the banquet, the king was sleepless. Esther still hadn't told him what she wanted, and reviewing his records, the king discovered that he hadn't honored Mordecai for helping save his life. Esther prepared another banquet. What's she up to? Obviously, time is running out, and she then plays with time, which I think helps the audience to get more anxious. Another banquet, this one to honor Mordecai. The stage was set for Esther to make her move. She finally told the king that she and Mordecai are Jews. And the mass execution order Haman was about to carry out in the king's name was her own death sentence. I think she succeeds with the king through these feasts and through the reasoning that, uh, that she does with him, saying, did you know? Introducing this information to him in, in a slow and careful way, taking her time to negotiate this complex um, social and power uh, dynamic. And so she is able to slowly introduce information in order to accomplish this end. And when he realizes that Haman is there to destroy the people, he can take that information that is being shared in a conversational way, in a non-threatening social environment. And then in that position of power, she uh, asks the question and the king is willing to give her what she wants and she asks for her people to be free. Here's Esther who could merely survive and could merely um, exist in the world as a beautiful being, as an object. And yet she is willing to come out of the closet, expose her Jewishness, expose her unique um, voice and, and act as an agent for the Jewish people. After Esther's confession, the king stormed from the room. He must choose between his wife and his most trusted advisor. King Xerxes stormed out of the banquet at which Queen Esther finally revealed her Jewishness. She had taken an enormous risk. She asks the king for a favor, which is to protect her people from destruction. And he says, the king says, well, who would want to destroy your people? Well, it's that wicked Haman who's right over there. And the king uh, gets upset and has to go out and collect himself out in the garden for a bit. And uh, while he's doing that, Haman, who realizes that this can't possibly be good for him, uh, throws himself on Esther's dining couch and begs for mercy. When the king re-entered the banquet, he saw Haman pleading with Esther for his life. If we can imagine Esther on her, reclined on her dining couch and Haman having thrown himself upon the couch somehow in close proximity to her, perhaps kneeling on the floor and draping himself uh, across her, the king comes back in the room and he sees Haman practically on top of his wife. So his first reaction is, what, the, the, he's trying to destroy her people, but, but first of all, he's gonna try to rape my own wife right here in, in my own palace? So that doesn't signal good things for Haman. His act of supplication is misread by the king as an act of belligerence or aggression. And it's another one of these comic misunderstandings that occur in the story that, that drive the narrative. Haman will be hanged on the very gallows built for Esther's cousin, Mordecai. By the end of the story, when Haman's about to be killed, he is bowing down at Esther, begging for his life. And we have a complete reversal from the beginning to the end. And this reversal had been engineered by Esther. 
the beauty queen with nerves of steel. You might say she is more Machiavellian. And from a feminist point of view, that shows intellectual strength and is just as equal a form of resistance as a direct confrontation. And in fact, insisting that a woman be able to directly confront a man is insisting that she use a masculine technique, which is confrontation. In a sense, she becomes the heroine because she's able to take advantage of her social position and um, get on the inside track with the powers that be to protect her people. And so we have all of these different elements of reversal that play out and make this a, a fun story. And the reader's aware of all of this as it's playing out. And that's sort of the, the fun tension that we have as readers, where we see how this is going to play out negatively for Heyman. And we, can, we know how he's going to get his comeuppance. You know, she purposely hides the fact that she's Jewish and she's advised to do so. And so she hides that fact. She sets up the situation to play out in a way that she wants to play it out. So she's kind of working behind the scenes, uh, maybe perhaps lying, although I think deceit is, is maybe a better way of thinking of it. Of course, it's the appropriate retribution because Haman was planning to kill Mordecai, Esther's uncle, um, on a gallows that he had had uh, specially prepared. Haman is, of course, hung on that very gallows. Just one problem. By law, even the king could not rescind royal edicts. The order to massacre the Jews still stood. It's a very strange ending to the story where this king who seems to have the power over everything, the power of life and death, but he doesn't have power over his own drunkenly issued edicts. So he has to issue another edict that will hopefully cancel that out. And in some ways that's making fun of the Persian Empire's bureaucracy. It's also making fun at the the re it's making fun in some ways of the, the powerlessness of this king, and there are hints of that throughout. King Xerxes gave the Jews permission to fight back and allowed powerful allies to help them. 75,000 people would be killed, including Prime Minister Haman's 10 sons. After the Holocaust, Esther's story of assimilation was seen in a new light. The story of Esther and its humor changes dramatically, I think, after World War II. You know, when we, I think when an ancient person was reading this story and they get to the end of the story where it describes thousands of people being slaughtered, right, and the potential for murder on a mass level, I think this wouldn't have been taken too seriously in ancient times. I think this would have been seen as all part of a fun story. Uh, nobody would have taken this seriously. This wouldn't have been really possible given the technologies of the time. But I think after various periods of, of real oppression uh, that Jews have felt, this story takes on more somber tones. And I think especially in theology post-Holocaust, a story about the potential genocide of the Jews has less humor in it than it would have in ancient times. When we talk about a post-Holocaust audience, that means us non-Jews as well as Jewish readers must read that story with horror and danger. After the Holocaust, Esther's assimilation and complicity in her objectification became more readily understandable as survival techniques. Esther uses her sexuality in the way that she was meant to do. She can use the erotic power she has as a form of cultural capital, and instead of using it in a way that's uh, humiliating, or derogatory, she uses it as a vehicle to um, communicate truth about her people and to save her people. So it's a very important book in terms of modeling what a person like Esther, who's a, a woman, she's a minority, she's not in a position of power, and yet she uses everything she has for the good of her people. And in some ways, I think this is one of the messages of the book for an audience in the post-exilic period when the Jews are not in power and they live in under foreign domination is that like Esther and her uncle Mordecai, you bring to the table what you have, you use what you have, and in the end, um, you can serve your people well. The story of Esther is really an encouragement to other Jews in the diaspora that you can make it. You can be two things. One, you can survive, but most importantly, you can be true to your own faith.
You can be true to the God of your ancestors, true to your religion, even as a Jew in a foreign land. And in fact, you can kind of win over uh, those who might oppress you by being true to who you are and by being true to your faith. This is not someone who's challenging society on every level. She doesn't have to go into every aspect of life and overthrow it and turn the world upside down. So she is like the everyday woman in modern society nowadays who in her own way can contribute to the good of society, who can use her virtue, her courage, her intelligence to negotiate very complex male-dominated structures in order to um, assert the truth and to bring um, the faithful um, throughout history and to move them throughout history. A complex and controversial character, Esther grew from beauty queen into her people's savior. <laughs>